go, man. If anybody shows up late, thank you. Oh, I need one. I need one of those. Thank you. Perfect. All right, let's get started here. I'll get those later. Um, just so everyone knows, before I forget to tell you, this is our last class for the semester. Um, if you've missed a bunch of them, as some of you have, um, we will, all of this stuff is on our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and just search the SCC Institute, all the stuff is there. Um, and then we will begin back up in the fall. So I'm kind of moving us through classes that naturally pick up on the heels of one another. So we, we started out a year ago with apologetics, and then last semester we did the Trinity, and then now we're doing interpretation and kind of how the Bible's put together. In the fall, we will study all the doctrines around the person and work of Christ. And so it's basically Christology. And there's a lot of that that we really can't escape the salvation subject matter, right? Because try to talk about Jesus without talking about salvation. Although a lot of that we will hold back for a year from now in the spring. We will talk specifically about humanity and sin, and then we'll expand out the doctrines of salvation a little bit further. So while we will we'll brush up against it naturally, so talking about Jesus, um, we're going to take all semester to just talk about him, uh, it, probably as a subset of the Trinity in, in many respects, but also um, about his ministry, and, and we'll be focusing on the Gospels, whereas our, our text or our, our class going through humanity and sin, that will force us in the following semester to spend more time in the epistles, which I like to describe the Gospels are the point of the Bible, and the epistles are just commentaries on applying the Gospels. That's kind of how it works. Um, and so we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the fall, and then next spring we'll spend a lot of time um, primarily in Romans. It's, it's, if I were to pick one book that really goes kind of head on into who is mankind and what, what's wrong with her and, and how do you fix it, I would say Romans and then running right next to it, I'd put Ephesians as those two books just tackle that subject um, quite a bit. So tonight, Justin did a great job last, uh, last week. I, uh, I was actually here. He was, thankfully, he let me get some other work done, but I was working in my office and I, because it's live streaming, I, could, I just had it on, on my iPad, and I was listening to him, trying to see if he said anything snarky that I needed to respond to later. Um, but he did a great job. And, uh, and so I appreciate him going through um, primarily literary context, although he brushed into historical context last week. And, uh, and here's the reason why we're not going on a like, full bore entire class on the idea of historical context. There's just, there's no way we could do it justice because every single book has its own historical context. And so short of um, buying an enormous library, I would say your best bet to understand the historical background of every single book is just a really good study Bible. That is your, like, that'll get you 90% of the way. And so the ESV study Bible is, of course, really good. The NLT has some good um, study Bibles. The NIV study Bible is really good. The new Zondervan one that came out a couple of years ago is like, there. I love this about the Christian world. There's the Bible wars. Like ESV and NIV are just lobbing shots at one another, trying to get the coolest Bibles out. And so NIV, the Zondervan version, there's two, two kind of wings of the NIV world. But the Zondervan version put out a great study Bible. And then there's some new ones. There's one that's all like cultural backgrounds. It's another NIV one that I just saw at a bookstore uh, last week. And so any of those would, would do a lot of work to helping us understand historical context. And, uh, of course, any particular commentary on a book ought to at least begin with that information. Um, here's what I want us to do. I want us to glance. We're going to be talking tonight about genre. And, and a quick look at each of these passages will help us see the importance of genre. And so I'm sure you can already see we're, we're covering different types of books here. We have narrative, um, theological narrative slash historical narrative. But this, even, even the idea of Genesis is a little different than the kind of narrative you find in, say, 2 Samuel, which is different than the book of John. Um, and I skipped prophecy 
and prophetic texts, just because for the sake of time. We'll, we'll talk about it here in a minute. But I didn't put an example in there, which we're going to kind of pick it up here. But John's gospel is both narrative and history, but I would call it more of a theological biography. Um, Acts is, is like a theological history. 1 Corinthians is an epistle, and Revelation is a, a multitude of genres to smash into one. It goes from epistle to narrative to apocalypse rather quickly. It just And then you just kind of have to know where it's switching. So I want to look at these and, and ask, how do we know what they mean? So, and I, and I tried to pick rather popular passages. So these are, these are things with which most of us are familiar. So Genesis 3... Um, in verse 15, this is the famous, famous kind of redemptive passage right after the fall. It says that, uh, this is God speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, the woman being Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Quick, just off the top of your head, what's this passage mean? What's it mean? What are we looking for now? Come on, we've heard of him. We know who Jesus is. So there's this enemy is going to be defeated, right? Now here's, what I, here's what's fascinating about this passage. You and I intuitively switch the genre in our head, and we know it's speaking figuratively. Was Jesus' heel ever bruised? Now he was beaten pretty bad right before the cross, so it's likely that he had some bruises below the knee. Um, but that seems, okay... It's not quite literal. And did Jesus step on Satan's head? Despite Mel Gibson's portrayal in The Passion, did he actually step on any snake's head? I'm not entirely sure that he did. Maybe just if it was a pest in the house. But what we come to rather quickly is the idea... Sorry, man, I'm loud. (laughs) What we come to rather quickly is that this is at least figurative. Doesn't make it untrue. And that's an important thing for us to sort through as we come to genres and how we read, interpret, and apply. Now, let's go here. Go to Genesis 11. A few pages over. This is uh, another famous passage, the Tower of Babel, or the Tower of Babel, whichever one you want to call it. So here, the verses I want to look at are verses 6 through 9. So, they've built the tower. Things don't look like they're going well. Um, Verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Now, is that actually true? Is there any way that they could, if God does not intervene, can finite human beings all of a sudden become capable of anything? Of course not. You and I know when to read hyperbole into the text. Or when to notice hyperbole in the text. If you were to spend any time at all sending like text messages with me, you would, you would learn very quickly. Well, Alyssa figured this out when she interned for me a couple of years ago. Even though she cannot hear my voice, she needs to know when to interpret sarcasm versus I'm being very direct and literal. A lot of it was sarcastic. And a lot of it is hyperbole, especially if we ask a dumb question. I'll give a hyperbolic answer, right? She's like, yeah. Um, so we know how to do that here. But here's what, here's like, this text is easy. And he says, come let us go down, verse 7, come let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Um, short, um, before, before Jesus shows up in Nazareth as a baby, or Bethlehem as a baby, um, where would God go down? Like, how could he go down anywhere? Like our theology of God says that he, he is omnipresent. There's nowhere He isn't. Which, by the way, dispels kind of the theology that says, you know what hell is? Hell is the one place that God just isn't. Nope, there's no place He isn't. He actually built hell, designed it, created it, and He cannot not be somewhere. He is omnipresent. There's nowhere He's not. So where does He go down to? Where was this tower that He wasn't there yet? All of a sudden, we go, we go from hyperbolic language to very figurative language. And this is one of the things that you pick up in, say, the Genesis account, um, probably more than any other book. Maybe the Exodus account, it comes up uh, a lot. But there's this um, anthropomorphic language that God uses to describe himself. He basically says, uh, if you read between the lines, look, um, Hearst, I know you're smart people. 
but you don't understand things like I understand them as God. Like you just you can't understand the God realm. So I'm just going to explain it to you in your language. It'd be like if I came down there and messed with things. You're like, oh, you came, you you actually went from somewhere up high down low. He's like, no, I'm explaining it to you in human terms because you're a human being and you can't hang with me. And but we know how to do that here. And and I'm 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 trying to to help us see genre is actually rather intuitive. You and I do it well most of the time. And then we open the book of Revelation and our minds just leap. We don't know how to do it anymore. Actually, I would say there are parts of the Gospels where we, we don't do it well. Say Jesus' final discourses where he's speaking judgment over the, the nation of Jerusalem. So much bad theology has come from forgetting that that is figurative language or hyperbolic language. Or, I mean, again, in favor or in, in defense of the sarcastic minded people in this room, Jesus speaks with deep, deep, cutting sarcasm off. And we have to know, this is the problem of not being there to hear him. We have to know how to read that. And that's, and that's what genre studies will help us do. 2 Samuel 7, the great Davidic covenant. Where am I at here? 2 Samuel 7. In verses 13 and 14, it says... Uh, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Speaking specifically to David about his son Solomon. David says, hey, I've like I, I got this beautiful palace, Lord, and, and you just have this little shabby tent where we put the, the, um, the, the Ark of the Covenant in. Let me build you something spectacular. He's like, listen, David, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but you're a man of blood. You, and, and, and we can't really be upset at David. He's just following the Lord's directive. But you're a man of blood, so I don't want you to build my house. There's something sacred about my temple. In fact, I'm going to have your son do it. And it says, he will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now, who's he talking about? Solomon or Jesus? Or a little bit of both. Did Jesus, here's the fun part that, that I really like to think through. Is Jesus currently reigning? I think so. Does he have a literal throne? Like when you and I think of a throne, it's like King Arthur, right? But is, does, is Jesus sitting down on a literal chair made of gold that's got a back that's strangely too high, and is he sitting there with a scepter? Maybe, but I don't know why we would all of a sudden, because the passages where that stuff is described are very figurative. And then we'll hone in on certain details and say, no, that's literal. And um, this passage, I don't, I mean, if you see how this passage is referenced in the prophets, um, there's, a, there's very little license that we have to, to take things so literally. Another area where we do it naturally is in John 6. These are the, the think of the seven I am statements, which are just literal descriptions of Jesus says, I am this. And so in, uh, in, at the end of this incredible time, where he, uh, he feeds the 5,000, he walks on water, and then Jesus gives this sermon that, by the way, is an excellent sermon, but clears the room. No one wants to follow him after this. But he says um, in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Has Jesus at every point in the history of everything been a loaf of bread? Is he a door? Is he a shepherd? Is he a rock? Is he, is he any of these things? No. I, for, for all we know, Jesus has never, ever, like, tended a flock of sheep. And he's a good shepherd. But you and I know how to switch to literal, literal, literal. I mean, I truly believe that he literally walked on water. Right? And then, he's, and then you and I also know that, okay, he's not saying that he's a loaf of bread. He's also not saying, you should really eat my body. That was a little confusing for them. Because later on... Um, he says this in verse 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, is Jesus advocating some ancient form of cannibalism? Or is he speaking like a figurative language? He, he goes in and out. It's not even as if the book 
itself is all figurative or all literal. Jesus' own speech, like mid-sentence switches. And so here's, what, here's kind of the question that you and I have to answer is, um, how do we know when, when, when he switches? Acts 10, verses 9 through 16, for the sake of time, I won't read it, but this is the, the vision that, Jesus, or that, that Peter has. All the food, all the animals float down, and he's like, I'm too good for that. I'm a, I'm a really good Jew. And, and the Lord says, kill and eat. And he's like, ah, it's unclean, Lord. And he's like, okay, look, I can make things clean. Kill and eat. Figurative or a literal vision? So this is where we can't even just relegate all visions to figurative language. Was that a real vision? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. Um, probably the hardest time we have with this stuff is, uh, and this is not the type of language, this is more about the date of the language. In 1 Corinthians 14, um, if my Bible wouldn't stick together, First Corinthians 14 is this. Paul says to the church in Corinth, As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. What do we do with that? It's, it's not figurative. It is clearly a very literal expression of an actual thought the Apostle Paul had. So is it shameful for Alex to actually speak in church? Or must she just hush, go home, and talk to Lyle about it? You see how this is an issue of application? Here's what I think Paul was saying. I think he was literally saying to the church in Corinth, women don't talk. And we find that offensive. Does that mean that now London can't talk? What do we do with London? She doesn't even have a husband, right? Maybe one day. I hope one day. Do you hope one day? Okay, well, there we go. But can, can she talk? Maybe we let her have a pass because she doesn't have anybody at home to go and ask. But can Alex talk? And this is where knowing the genre, knowing this about epistles, that they are occasional documents and they are written into specific situations. Well, that would make me ask a question like, what's the situation, what, what's Paul responding to? And, and just to, like a quick explanation of what's actually going on. In ancient Corinth, before the gospel got there, women weren't even allowed in houses of worship. They didn't even have an opportunity to come and talk. And they certainly were not educated in religious matters. All of a sudden, the gospel shows up and it gives dignity to women. They get to be like fully functioning partners in the church and in the gospel. But they show up and they, they, they've never been taught in this stuff. And what, if you read everything around it, Paul's biggest concern here is orderly worship. And he says, look, there's this group in the church that is really disruptive. It's those of you that haven't been able to be here ever, and you just keep asking elementary questions. I always make the, the, the analogy, it's like me going to Oklahoma State University into a Ph.D. level chemistry classroom and raising my hands, hey, can you explain to me the periodic table of elements? I think everybody in that room would say, enough. You are, we're not getting anything done. You do, you're asking elementary questions. Go home, read the textbook. Go home and ask someone who knows these answers and come back and let us get something done with our time. Paul's saying, when we gather together, it's for the purpose of worship. So if you don't understand something that's really basic, rather than just interrupting everything constantly, like go home and like be educated. And by the way, we might look at this as a very oppressive text, but really this is a text where the gospel is dignifying women. And the husbands owed their wives nothing in the ancient world, particularly in the ancient Greek world. And Paul is saying, not only do I want you to be here, but I want you to come and worship well. And so here's what I'm going to say. You, teacher, 
And you would feel, wow, I can't believe I get to be here. And you would be like, man, I got to go teach her stuff. Like, it, it, more than anything, we look at this as an oppressive text. It is much more offensive to the men in ancient Corinth than it would be to the women. And, and, and yet, whenever we read this and we don't do the historical background, and we don't recognize that this was written as a letter into an actual historical situation, we're like, wow, Paul's such a misogynist. And if you were to ask him in the ancient world, he's like, what are you talking about? Super pro woman. I'm so glad they get to worship with us. Now let's educate them so that they can worship well. And do you see the difference between just a surface level reading and a deep reading of the text? And by the way, I'm not going to say that finding that information is necessarily easy, although it is probably two clicks on Amazon away from being easy. It's, but it takes work, and it takes diligence. But sometimes we'd just rather be offended than do any work. So um, the genre will help us figure these things out. Now here's the fun one, Revelation 12, verses 1 through 7. Revelation is, because of its genre, one of the books that everyone's a little scared of. And I won't say that it's just abundantly clear. It's actually intended to be cryptic. But it isn't that hard if you know what you're looking for. So Revelation 12, verse 1 says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that she bore her child, uh, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, who, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Many times have I, have I heard this explained as part of just the terror that is to come in the future. Really, this is, this is John the Apostle's version of Christmas. It's the Christmas story. It's the coolest version of the Christmas story, by the way. Puts Matthew's and Luke's to shame. But if, you, if you'll recall, Luke doesn't have a Christmas narrative. John doesn't have a Christmas narrative because John put his in Revelation. This is the woman, actually. It, it could be Mary, but it, I think it better describes Israel. And if you go through and look at the parallels between Israel and her other, other like referent in the book of Revelation, it's the church. And so this describes the, the people of God giving rise to the Messiah. And, and I mean, it, all of this stuff is it's Christmas. Yet, if we don't know the genre of this book, we start reading this stuff and then the stuff coming down about the beast and the prostitutes and all of this stuff and the two witnesses, and we don't know what to do with it. And it's, okay, well, what's the genre? This is Apocalypse. Do you read it literally? I sure hope not. <laughs> the biblical writers didn't read it literally, by the way. Peter employs apocalyptic liter uh, um, literature or imagery in his Pentecost sermon when he directly applies a Joel 2 quote about the sun standing still and things turning, like the moon turning to blood. This is not a John Hagee blood moon book. This is, this is apocalyptic literature. And we need to learn how to, to read this stuff. So, all that, here are our literary types. So, genre is a class or category of literature having a particular style, form, and content. You and I do this well all the time. If, it, if you get a letter from your mom, you know how to read that. If you read Romeo and Juliet, you know how to read that, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a... By the way, Romeo and Juliet, for all of the, like the classical literature you know, attention it gets, it's a really filthy book. Like, if you can, if you can read past the imagery, it's just... I, ha I once, for a... I had a, a literature class in, in college, and we had to read Romeo and Juliet. We had to read an annotated version, so like a classic, like a Shakespearean scholar's notes are in the margins. And I read it, and I put it down, and it felt dirty. It's basically like... Um, it's just porn. Like, that's all it is. It is filthy. But Shakespeare gets away with it because he covers it in all this imagery. We, we can figure that out. We can read Huckleberry Finn. We can read a biography about Lincoln, and we know the difference between the two. A biography about Lincoln and Huckleberry Finn are two books about American slavery. 
One's a biography and one is, um, is just a, a wonderful, wonderful um, novel, I guess you could call it, but work of fiction that's intended to, to comment on racism in the American South. And, and another one is telling the story of someone who did something about it. Both of them tackling, by and large, the same subject. One through fiction and one through biography. We know how to read them. And, uh, no one here believes Huckleberry Finn was a real person. And, and I haven't met someone who believes that, that Lincoln was fictional. So we know how to do genre. We, we do this every time we open up Netflix and we got to pick a, a, a genre. So here's what Grant Osborne says. He says, genre is more than a means of classifying literary types. It is an epistemological tool or a tool for knowing stuff that, that we use for unlocking meaning in individual texts. Grant Osborne, in, in effect, and I'm assuming this is um, from his book, The Hermeneutical Spiral. Very, very good book. Um, what he's saying is your best bet towards understanding the meaning of a biblical passage is to understand its genre first. So what does this mean? First of all, the biblical authors knew of different genres. Like, Paul was aware that apocalyptic literature existed, and yet he chose to write, he chose to write letters. And, and, and here's the fun thing about Paul. Um, most of his letters are primarily kind of straightforward, didactic, logical stuff. And then in places like in, in Galatians, I think it's four, he'll, he'll employ allegory. And he gets to play the apostle card and play some silly games like that that you and I probably don't have any business from drawing allegorical ideas out of the Old Testament, but Paul did. So how do we know between Galatians 3 and 4 to switch? First of all, Paul kind of tells us, but it's now, okay, I've got to read for at least a moment something very, very different. John, as a letter writer, writes very differently than Paul. It's not very logical and linear. It's still a letter, but John employs a lot more imagery in his and he swirls around topics. They knew of different genres. John, John wrote three. He wrote Gospel, and he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then he wrote the Revelation. Luke wrote a Gospel, which is slightly different than um, a book of just more pure history, the book of Acts. The biblical authors intentionally selected a particular genre to accomplish their purpose for writing. Um, Mark's gospel is pure story. True, but pure story. Luke's gospel is story, narrative, but it's actually, if you kind of go and look at how it begins, and how the book of Acts begins as well, it's the world's longest letter. <laughs> like basically, and it's to one guy. Like can you imagine being Theophilus, getting the mail that day? It's like, geez, Luke, it's not like I had anything else to do. It's the longest letter ever. John wrote his as more of like a public letter, a circular letter to the church in Ephesus, which he was pastoring at the time. Matthew likely wrote his to the church in Jerusalem. And you can say, well, how do you know these things? Well, you look at clues in the letters. Matthew's is very Jewish, written to a clearly Jewish audience. Mark is written from a Jewish perspective to a Gentile audience because he explains a lot of Jewish ideas, kind of like in a childlike way, like you wouldn't know the language and you wouldn't know the customs. So let me explain some things. Luke's is just clearly a letter, he tells us. The biblical authors expected the readers to interpret their letters in accordance with the genre selected. And that is so important. When John sends his gospel um, to the, the church in Ephesus, I actually think he was there, but he's, like, he's uh, by this point, he would have been the last living apostle, I believe. And I believe that the church in and around Ephesus wanted him to put down a definitive witness to Jesus. And, and in many ways, that's why his is so different than the other three. But when, when this is written for the church, he has no intention that they would read his gospel as a prophetic text or as a historical text, although it contains history. He's writing it as a theological biography, as a gospel. As a, as a biography, it's not just telling facts. It has a very clear agenda. And that doesn't make it untrue. It's important for us to see that. I can write things with an agenda. I write, everything I write has a purpose. And everything I write, I'm intending for you to read it as I wrote it. Is it London, have you ever been frustrated when someone misunderstood one of your text messages that you sent? When they, when they read in a tone that you didn't intend? 
it's hard for us sarcastic folk when we're trying to be serious and people think we're being sarcastic. At the, in the end, we all want to be read on our own terms. I do not want to give something to someone and they misconstrue it to mean something else. And so the author, this is why we, talk, why we talk about author's intended meaning a lot through this class. The author controls the meaning and they write with the expectation that the audience understands that and will read it according to what they intended. And church history is full of us doing not well at that. Um, there are different genres. So here are most of the kinds. You could, you could probably slice these down a little further if you wanted to. There is narrative. Um, in the Old Testament, there's law. So like, it's like switching from um, David McCullough's 1776 to just reading the Constitution to now his book on John Adams. We went from history to legal document to history. That's what you do when you go from Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers. Do you know how to make the switch in your head? You're now reading kind of legal jargon. And all of a sudden, it, I believe same author, but right. I believe Moses wrote all five books of the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I believe that Moses, he changes. In Genesis, he's more of a poet. It's got this flowery language. Same thing, I believe, in Exodus, although it becomes more kind of rote history. In Leviticus, he just kind of becomes rather cut and dry. Well, he's putting down the legal code. And in Numbers, he gets really dull because now we're talking about just names, right? With not a lot of commentary. Sometimes he'll get to an interesting person and be like, and this person, you never guess what they did. And then he'll just go on and name, name, name. And then Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy has this like somber tone to it. It's the final book. It's the book that details Moses' death. And by the way, we also know that means he probably couldn't have written all of it. But it's the second telling of the law. And um, the, the books change. Can we change with them? If our goal is to read them on their terms, can we change with them? Um, there's poetry, and, and one of the hallmarks of poetry is that it's very non-literal. There is proverb, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about how to read proverbs. Um, there's something different than Proverbs, although Proverbs would be considered a wisdom book. Wisdom literature is like Ecclesiastes and Job. These are, like, um, these are books that comment on what life is like at a very generic high level, um, much like a proverb, actually. And so um, that's a little bit different than Proverbs and certainly different than poetry, which would be like the book of Psalms or um, certain sections of Genesis. Prophecy which is a, a significant section of the, of the Old Testament, and then genealogies. In the New Testament, you have gospel, and within the gospel, you have all this stuff. You have parables. Um, the opening to at least one gospel is a, a letter or an epistle form. You have apocalyptic literature, which you also have in the Old Testament prophetic literature, by the way. I just didn't put it twice. Um, you have prophecy in the New Testament. Um, specifically in the Gospels, which are also a bit of narrative. And the Gospels also have genealogies, and the Gospels also have historiography. So you have in each of these, um, a num in, in the same book, you have to be able to kind of switch gears and read the keys. So let's look, and, and this, this stuff is more intended to be kind of worked through slowly, but just some basic principles for some of the biggest sections of Scripture on how to read these. So Old Testament narrative. This would include Genesis, Exodus, much of Leviticus, virtually all of Numbers, all of Deuteronomy, um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and on and on and on. And even parts of the prophetic books. First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, um, Esther, which is an interesting one. All these things are narrative. Basically, they're stories. So here's some key things to remember in the narratives. God did not give us a list of doctrines, a set of beliefs, a bunch of confessional statements, a systematic theology, or an index. We came up with all that from reading the narratives, and from reading the epistles, and from reading the scriptures. But I, I find this interesting that we can debate over, like, theologies of, of salvation. Um, well, let's, let's pick a contentious one. Theology, uh, like a, a theology of the doctrine of election. Fun one to debate, right? And seemingly one everybody needs an answer to today or they're going to die. Um, like God didn't give us that answer 
verbatim. I actually don't think it's like too complicated to find the answer in certain sections of Romans or Ephesians again. Um, 1 John. But we don't have, this is what we believe about election. God didn't give us that. He gave us stories where it's discussed. He gave us letters where it's discussed. And you and I get to say, okay, um, occasional documents written to the church at Ephesus. Okay, let's do the legwork. Because it might be true for all people for all time. It might be like women speaking in church. You and I get to figure out how to tell the difference. So he didn't give us those things. And, and, and especially as it relates to narrative, it's important to realize that the Bible needs to be understood as a singular story. You and I would, would call someone nuts for... What, what's your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie of all time? What? Phantom of the Opera. Okay. So if I were to pick like 58 minutes in and watch 30 seconds and then come to you, who's an expert at the Phantom of the Opera, and say, okay, let me tell you what the director meant by this movie. Let me tell you what he believes about X, Y, and Z. You would say, okay, from 30 seconds, you got all that. It's amazing. It, you couldn't have been more wrong, actually. We do this with Bible all the time, except we, we couldn't even come close to something as big as 30 seconds, because usually we like to cherry pick verses and then construct entire theologies. And it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you start at Genesis 1 and go to Revelation 22 and come to that? It's like, no. I read Nahum 1. Okay. Well, then you need to sit down for a little while and keep reading. It is one big story. And this is important because right beside that you can write, um, there's this, this tactic the, in terms of interpretation called the analogy of Scripture. Meaning, if you read, say, John 6.35, and you come to some, you know, wonderful conclusions based on this, some real heavy-hitting theological idea. Here's the good news. The Bible is a singular story inspired by one God. And it speaks, it, it's got a coherence to it. And if what I believe here runs in a contradictory manner to everything else, the good news is the answer is as simple as, well, I have to be wrong. Like, I, like I don't get to just come here and choose something that the rest of the Bible disagrees with. That means I got this wrong. Doesn't mean the rest of the Bible's wrong. Doesn't mean this is wrong. It means I'm wrong. And it's an interpretation issue. And what we, we can avoid that problem by remembering, okay, it's one big story. So it's got to all sing the same song. Now, this is why you, when you see lots of books of interpretation, they have like pictures of symphonies on the front. And it's a, it's a rather thinly veiled idea, but it's one sound, multiple instruments. Genesis is playing this rhapsody. Genesis is playing this incredible piece of music. But it's playing it with Revelation and Romans and Nahum. One sound, multiple instruments. And Genesis doesn't get to go off on a solo whenever it wants. It's got to play with the rest of the guys. And so we've got to keep that in mind when we're interpreting. Stories can be both prescriptive and descriptive. You and I have talked about this a number of times throughout this class. So we don't need to go labor long on that idea. But the, the point is, pay close attention, because sometimes it's just telling you what happened. And sometimes it's instructing you what you ought to do. And they're not always the same thing, but they do sometimes come on the heels of one another. Um, the biblical stories are not just stories about people. It's important to remember that. This, these are all, I mean, these are telling us something about the... The, the one who created these people, their relationship to him. In fact, I would say they're first and foremost not about people. And sometimes we forget that when we read. They're not allegories filled with hidden spiritual meanings. Um, so it's not as though, like, when we go and we read about the, the woman, the, her, her descendant would... Uh, the, the snake would bruise his heel and then he would, he would crush its head or bruise its head. It's not like, okay, I wonder who the snake is. It's probably Putin. And who is the descendant? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I'm really all that. I, I don't want to say it's Trump. Maybe it's the next president. But it's like, it's not all these allegories. And sometimes we play that game. And, and here's the, the one rule we've forgotten. It cannot now mean what it has never before meant. So Genesis was written to a very real community called Israel. They had no idea anyone named Putin would exist. They had no idea anything like Russia would ever exist. They weren't even sure that there was land up there, right? 
So when, when this document comes to them, it has to mean something to them. And so what, that, what it very, very much means to the nation of Israel, this particular passage, it means, okay, some human being is going to take part with the divine in the overthrow of the adversary. That's what it meant. And they had the rest of their history to figure that out. And then when he came, they rejected him. But it was there. Some stories need other stories to fully explain their meaning. In fact, I would say there are a number of stories that we don't really understand their significance until the New Testament comes in and comments on them. And there's a number of accounts, particularly in the book of Exodus, that the Apostle Paul actually clarifies for us in his epistles. Otherwise, we would have not caught all the nuance of that meaning. So the key thing here is the purpose of the biblical narrative is not to talk about what happened in the past, but it relates past events to how we should live. They are instructional. And, and so, like, Moses isn't communicating the history of Israel to Israel just so that they could have a record. He's, he is instructing them via story. They are meant to move you towards something or more likely towards someone, towards the Lord. And, and so we have to keep that in mind. Proverbs. Proverbs are, are short, pithy sayings. That they, are, they are in frequent and in widespread use. And they express a basic truth or a practical precept. Can anybody think of like a modern proverb? Surely we have a modern proverb. Lots of little silly sayings. Give what? A man a give a man a fish or teach him a fish. Yeah. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day or teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime, right? Or you take the Ron Swanson approach and don't teach a man to fish. Fishing's not that hard, right? Um, the, but either way, we have, we have a, a parable. Or sorry, a proverb. Now, does it mean that, like, you can never really give somebody something and just really help them out? Must you always teach them how to do things for themselves? No, it's a general maxim. And it's not meant to be pressed to the nth degree. So raise up a child in the way he should go, and, he, and when he grows old, he'll never depart from it. That's a... Ryan Vincent remix of a proverb. But does that mean that like good parents never end up with bad kids? Of course not. Like I know good parents all over the place who love their children and prayed for their children and, and, and like discipled their children and their children still suck. Like it's just some you just can't get around it sometimes. But generally speaking, would you take good parenting over bad parenting? I take my odds on good parenting. That's all the Proverbs are. They're general maxims, not absolute truths. And sometimes we will push them. This is in a lot of prosperity theology. The Proverbs are just bent to the point that they start to break. They're taken as promises from God. It's not all. It's just kind of general descriptions about how life goes. Generally um, interesting ways that life takes place. So the key things to remember, the Bible teaches that a wise person should know how to act and speak in appropriate ways in order to enrich life. This is why studying the Proverbs is good. It's like, okay, generally speaking, this is how life is, is meant to work in, in, a, in a fully functioning way. But wisdom begins with an attitude of submission to God. And there's a couple of cautions here when we apply them. They're not exhaustive. There are exceptions. We already discussed that. Misused Proverbs can justify an unbiblical lifestyle. Does... Um, Anybody believe that it is an appropriate thing to actually take a rod and beat a child? Probably not, especially if you're near a construction site, right? And we're talking about like, like rebar. Like if that's, if that's the closest thing I have to a rod. No, it's saying, I, I think in a nutshell, it's not prescribing how discipline takes place, just that it should. But when you just bend it to its most literal degree, DHS is on the way. Um, Proverbs provide inspired principles. It's important that though they cannot be used in an exhaustive way, they are divine principles. And so, I, I, you know, while I don't, you know, go Tanya Harding on my son, I do discipline him. And I do believe that it is a God-ordained thing that parents discipline their kids. I provide instruction and I provide boundaries, and I provide correction. And were I to just take all of that away, I believe that I am violating a divine mandate to steward my son towards 
obedience and, and I think in turn godliness. So here's the key. The purpose of biblical Proverbs is to show that the wisdom of life consistently live from a biblical perspective. And it's important to know, though, that the Bible doesn't put down intelligence, but it never prizes the accumulation of knowledge over wisdom. Um, wisdom, I think, is, is actually knowledge applied. It's one thing to just know everything. And, and cool, impressive, probably going to do you some good at some level. But to know how to take like the divine decrees and apply them, that's wisdom. And that is what the Bible actually champions, is wisdom. Flip it over. Prophecy. Prophecy. An often underrated section of your Old Testament, and one where there's some very rich theology to be found. Prophecy is an inspired word from a prophet viewed as revelation of God's purpose and will. So, um, here's the breakdown. You have the major prophets and the minor prophets. And this is not to say that the f big four are any better than the other ones. Just that they are big. That's all we mean by major. It's like, come on. If you really want to get through a whole prophetic word, you could. I think Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible. Word count. Just ex ruthless. And, uh, and he gets kind of um, emo after a while. Jeremiah's got, some, I mean, he, he's the weeping prophet. He's got some problems. But these are the four big boys, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Isaiah is my favorite. I think it's the closest thing to a gospel in the Old Testament, especially 40 through the end of the book. And then Jeremiah is a fascinating book in which you'll find the, the great concept of the new covenant that would one day come in Jesus. Ezekiel is the uh, is just if you want to find ancient sci-fi it's Ezekiel it's crazy like the book just opens up with this like alien figure that's God it's it's nuts but in Ezekiel like chapters 32 through 40 you have some of the most incredible stuff about God coming to fix everything and he's like look here's the good news guys I'm gonna put in you a new heart I'm gonna pour out my spirit on you and your leaders have been awful to you, and they've run this country into the ground. But the good news is I'm going to be done with them soon, and I will be your shepherd. And, and here's why I love reading those passages, because then when you go, and you go to John 6, to the feeding of the 5,000, have you ever wondered why it describes in John 6, when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, that he sets everybody down on the green grass? Why does John tell us the grass is green? It's a, it's a shepherding pastoral imagery. And Jesus, Jesus cares for the flock. He describes them as a flock of sheep. And he puts them down on this meadow and he feeds them. So the promised good shepherd from Ezekiel, I think 34, shows up in John 6 and it's Jesus, the good shepherd. And I just, that's why I love that particular section. And then Daniel, in Daniel 7, you have the one like the Son of Man. And then my favorite name for, for God is the Ancient of Days. This is just an incredible picture. And then everything after, like, chapters 9 or 10, you just probably should buckle up, because who knows what it means, right? I, I, I just, that part of the Bible is the enigma to me, the end of Daniel. But those are the big boys. And then there's the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, um, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Some of those are, um, this, this is why it's important to do your historical legwork. Some of these prophets are pre-exile um, and some are post-exile. So like Isaiah prophesies, you know, at least one generation, if not two, before the Assyrian conquest. He prophesies in like the 800s B.C. Jeremiah can see it coming. Jeremiah is very close. Ezekiel, he's, his stuff actually happens in, like, in captivity. Daniel, in captivity. Daniel and the lion's in. Where's the lion's in? It's in Babylon. So you have different, like you have people commenting on the same things from pre-exile, it's coming, it's coming, and then Ezekiel and Daniel, told you, see, here it is, and they, they're commenting on it. And you have the same thing in the minor prophets. And in the minor prophets, you actually have post-exile coming in. So like um, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi are all after they've already returned, and Jerusalem is like laying in ruins and they're now trying to put the country back together. And, and th these are important books. I mean, Hosea is the book where we get this picture of a, a faithful husband married to a prostitute, which is Jesus and his bride. 
In Zechariah, we get this incredible picture of the, the, your king coming to you on a donkey. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 14, you have this coming day of the Lord. Jonah, you have the, the God who is so reckless with his forgiveness, he would even give it to Nineveh. I don't care how much of a problem you have with it, Jonah. Jonah is like, I knew you would be this gracious. And God's like, I know, that, that's who I am. It, there's, like, there's gospel stuff in all of these people, and, and I think we should probably read them more. So, but it's important. There's ways to read it. Prophecy is not synonymous with prediction. Like The prophets don't just spend all their time telling us what's going to happen in the future. The vast, vast, vast majority of their time is commenting on what's happening at that moment. And so sometimes we just read them as like fortune tellers. And very little of what they do is actually considered future-oriented. So less than 2% of the prophetic texts have anything to do with Jesus, although they ultimately all have something to do with Jesus, but they're not overt messianic prophecies. Less than 5% describes the new covenant, although it's there, and less than 1% describes events still to come. So what are they talking about then? What's so prophetic? The vast majority of the prophets speak about judgment against disobedient Israel and Judah. Um, and that's explained here in 5. The prophets' words were intended to call people to repentance. They served as prosecuting attorneys. And so if I'm a prophet in Israel, I would come and I would basically say, all right, Judah, you done messed up again. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to point back to the covenant. I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, okay, what did Moses say? And what did Moses say? And what did Moses say? What did Moses say? And what did Moses say? And what did God do? And what did God do? And what did God do? Okay. So why Baal? Why did we put the calves back up in Dan and Beersheba? Why did we do this? Because you remember Exodus 32, guys. The calf thing was a bad idea. That's what prophets did. They would remind you of the covenant and say, repent, let's knock this calf down. And then, and then they would just get beat up. But that's kind of their lifestyle. As the prosecutor, they would come in and they would point out the sin in Israel and they would say, there is a standard. A prosecuting attorney would look at a, uh, at a, at a soon-to-be convicted criminal, I guess, and say, look, here's the standard, U.S. Constitution. Here's how you violate it. Here's what the punishment's going to be. That's what prophets did. Here's the standard, Mosaic Law. Here's how you violated it. Here's what the punishment's going to be. Seventy years in Babylon. That's what they did most of the time. And it's important to remember that when we're reading through them. The prophet spoke from the context of the Mosaic Covenant. And so though Isaiah is speaking in roughly 800, 850 B.C., his world, his mind is shaped by this document that was written in the 1450s, the Mosaic Law. That's what he shows up to speak about. And that's what he insists on them working through. Now there are the, the apocalyptic parts of the, of the prophets that we talked about, or that I mentioned. We'll talk about that here in a second when we, get, when we end with Revelation. Okay, so in the New Testament, the gospel, literally the term just means good news. So there is this thing that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John felt needed to be proclaimed. They called them gospels. Key things to remember in the gospels, the primary intention of the gospels is not to report the events of Jesus, but to call people to faith and faithfulness. They're not just historical documents. They're intended to be persuasive documents. They're intended to convince. You get that much from the end of John's book. I've written these things so that you would believe. That's how John kind of ends his gospel. And it's important to remember that that's what they are not just reporting the facts. They have an agenda. It doesn't mean that they're making things up. Fake news really wasn't an idea back then. They are, they are intentionally putting the information in front of you that will persuade. That's not the same thing as being deceitful. The center of Jesus' message was the preaching of the kingdom of God. Um, Matthew and Mark both open up with this thing, the, with this idea that Jesus has come to announce the kingdom and to establish that it is already at hand. And, and I love this connection in Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, I think. Yes. So it says, Now after John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So, and this is where we kind of read and follow Mark's train of thought. Okay, he's proclaiming the gospel of God. 
And then Mark explains what that is. What's the gospel of God? Jesus is saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel? It's that the kingdom has finally come. And then we'll find out throughout Mark's gospel that that's come in the person and work of Jesus, the servant. In Mark's gospel, we have Jesus as the suffering servant from Isaiah 52 and 53 and 42. And, and belief in him is admission into the kingdom. And that's the gospel. That's the central point of the gospel message is that the, the preaching of the kingdom of God. Number three, the gospels are not history or biography in the 21st century sense, but are historically reliable. They are not like bent on telling the story from your birth to your death. Although Matthew and Luke kind of do. But they're like, you and I look at this like, okay, what are you hiding by not telling us about Jesus' teenage years? I want to know, was he the perfect child and were his brothers and sisters jealous? I want to know that. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say irrelevant information. Like, but it's a biography. And like, no, it's not. It's a gospel. It's the good news of the kingdom. Not sure if Jesus' teenage years, other than the little stint at the temple, which was hilarious. Not sure if that really merits us mentioning. By the way, paper is expensive in the old world. And, and we just have so much. And we feel like we did quite a good job. So they are, they're not playing by the rules, especially John, in terms of chronology. You and I would lose it if David McCullough starts to jumble the order of events when he's writing American history. John's like, hmm, I don't care. I'll kind of swirl it around. And he just, he, he organizes his, his biography of Jesus, if you want to call it that. He organizes his gospel thematically. Does not really give a rip about chronology. Um, some specifics as you read and apply the Gospels. The Gospels are written to a specific audience and situation. We've already discussed that a little bit. They are manuals for discipleship. If you look at how Jesus is, how, how he trains people, they're telling us how, okay, this is how you make Christians, which is always daunting for me because I feel like, okay, I need to have people move in with me for three years. That seems to be what Jesus is up to. And I think I could probably disciple, what, 30, 40 people? And I'm looking at like, Jesus is like 12, and only 11 of it took. So sometimes we look at this and we're like, okay, discipleship is just a lot slower than I expected. And it, and it involves this really life on life. And this, actually reading through the, the gospel accounts with this idea in mind that these tell us a lot about the discipleship process has forced my wife and I to consider, like we open up our house a lot more to people. Like uh, discipleship for my wife is not always going to Aspen Coffee and talking about the Psalms with somebody. Most of the time it actually looks like coming over to our house and just folding the laundry of two little kids that just make piles of it. But like spending time with my wife is discipleship. Spending time with godly people doing just everyday things, that seems to be discipleship. And having important conversations all around the, the perimeter doesn't take teaching off the table, but sometimes we just want to relegate discipleship to, I'm going to teach you the Bible. And Jesus did that. And Jesus also just like, okay, we're going to go up on the mountain now. We're going to go across the lake now, boys. Let's go. That was kind of, do you see that as part of his discipleship? Number three on page four, be sure to read the Gospels vertically and horizontally that tell us something about our relationship with one another and something about our relationship with God. Key thing here is the purpose of the Gospels is to tell the story of the good news that God's kingdom has come through the life and teaching of Jesus. Moving on to epistles. These will be rather quick, so, but I want to finish with the apocalypse. Um, Epistles are writing directed from an apostle to a person or a group, usually formal, often didactic or oratory in nature. And what that means is they were written to, say, First and Second Timothy were written to one guy. So it's like, hey, Timothy, read this and do it. That's kind of Paul's thing. But Paul writes the, um, who does he write Galatians to? To the churches in Galatia. So here's what's important for us to remember about the, the epistles. In fact, much of the biblical literature was written to illiterate people or illiterate communities, I guess you should say. There would be people that could read in the, in the recipients category. But So the letter to the Galatians, though, is written to the leadership of the churches of Galatia to be read over the people. 
And I think that that's a very interesting aspect to the, the epistles, is they are meant to be heard. So you and I spend a lot of time reading them. Like uh, Galatians was intended that a pastor, an elder, would stand up in the public area and say, all right, Christians, huddle up. we got something from Paul. And then you would start to read out loud what Paul wants us to know. And you have to imagine that uh, things got a little weird whenever he got to the section about circumcision and how angry Paul is. Um, I'm trying to find it, but I can't find it right now. But basically, he says, um, if you guys are so concerned with circumcision, where is it? Yeah. I don't remember where it is. What chapter? First chapter? Basically, there's this spot, and I don't know why I'm blanking on it, um, where he's so mad at them <laughs> for making such a big deal about circumcision that he wants them to, he basically says, like, if you love it so much, why don't you just cut the whole thing off? Just go ahead and finish the job. If you think that trimming a little bit means anything, just finish up. And I could just imagine <laughs> the elders, I hope they read through it firsthand so they knew how to get the tone right, right? Okay, all right, I got to go out there and be kind of mean. That's what Paul wants me to be, mean. And, uh, but the point being, these are meant to be listened to. And this is why I believe that the YouVersion Bible app is such a valuable tool because for like the four or five most popular translations, they have the audible versions and you can just listen to it. And the truth is, we might think, that, wow, I can't believe you're just wasting your time listening. I read it. I'm spiritual. It's like, well, actually, Paul intended for Romans to be heard. Not read. Heard. And, and it always shocks me whenever I'll sit down and just listen to a passage with which I might actually be rather familiar, what I'll hear in a different way. Ah, uh, I didn't notice that. I pick up on re repeated words and phrases a lot quicker hearing them than I do reading them. Because we tend to read in snippets and take a break and read in snippets. But if you just kind of sit and listen to someone read it over, you'll hear a repeated phrase. And that can be really helpful in driving our minds towards what, we, uh, what the author intended for us to, to see. So key characteristics, they are occasional documents. We've already discussed that. You need to recreate the historical, letter, uh, the historical setting of the letter, part of them being occasional. We've got to build what was going on in first century Ephesus when Paul wrote Ephesians. By the way, if you just want to, like, if you're like, okay, I don't know where to start with historical context. Ephesus is, like, the best place to start. Because here's all the books written to the church in Ephesus. Um, John's Gospel, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 1st, um, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. All of those were written to the church in Ephesus. It's like the most popular church in the New Testament. And so if you're like, okay, well, what's the most bang for my buck in doing some real historical study? Ephesians, or Ephesus. You get you a, a gospel, several letters, and the book of Revelation. It's like, man, a lot of bang for your buck there. Um, retrace the author's argument, kind of, this is why study Bibles, this isn't a study Bible, but a study Bible with like an outline of the book at the beginning of the chapter, or the, the kind of the introduction of the book can be really helpful. You can see, okay, I see where Peter's going to go. Um, okay, I get it. And then whenever you go and read his letter, you know where you are in the argument, right? And, and sometimes that can just be really helpful. Specific steps on how to interpret and apply. Determine what the text meant to the biblical audience, because if it didn't mean something to them, it cannot mean it to us. List significant similarities and differences between the original audience and us. There are lots of them. Determine the theological principles in the text. Really, really helpful. And decide how we should apply the principles to get today. So... There's the difference between we need to know what it mean, what it meant, to know its um, principles in order to apply it. And it's important that we don't look at the meaning and just do a direct application, but it's do it's look at the meaning and draw the principles out. Because go back to 1 Corinthians 14. We could say, well, Paul meant women can't talk in church, and therefore 
women don't talk in church. But whenever you actually go in and kind of do all the legwork, it's Paul meant women cannot talk in church. The overarching principle in that is he loves unity and order in worship services. Okay, how do we do that here? What is disrupting a worship service at Sunnybrook? That's actually a real interpretation and application of 1 Corinthians 14. Not, therefore, women don't speak. It's probably, therefore, women and men probably shouldn't speak during Jim's sermon. It's distracting. People probably shouldn't spend a whole bunch of time playing on their phone. It's distracting. I can think of lots of things that are distracting. And, and Paul would say, yeah, don't do that. So the key here is the um, principle of the biblical letters is to remind the people of God how to live out the implications of the gospel and life in the kingdom of God. Like I said, I believe the letters are just commentary on how to apply the gospel into um, specific churches. Apocalypse, the fun one, derived from the Greek word meaning revelation or uncovering or revealing something. That's, that's really all it is. It's an uncovering. And used to refer to a pattern of thought in a form of literature, both dealing with future judgment. So key things to remember, and, uh, and again, the apocalyptic side of, of the, the revelation actually doesn't start until chapter 4. Chapter 1 is the introduction, kind of the historical situation of John on the island of Patmos and encountering the risen Christ and falling down as though dead. Yeah, you, you meet the Alpha and the Omega. That's really not apocalypse yet. That's more historical interaction, divine and human. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we get epistles to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We read those like letters. And then in 4, we enter into the throne room and all chaos breaks loose. And now it's apocalypse. And so that's where some of this, these principles will work. The taproot of apocalyptic literature is the Old Testament prophetic literature, especially as is found in Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and parts of Isaiah. If you want to know what Revelation means, study those books, because those are literally the word and image banks that the Apostle John uses. You can you could take all the, like the crazy phrases from Revelation, many of them, and just search, and you'll find a very direct reference in one of the prophets. And John's using that imagery. Because I won't say that the book of Revelation is a, a, something written in code, although it's intended to be kind of symbolic and mysterious. But it's written to Christians who know their Bibles. And if I were to write something that's supposed to be very image-driven, I'm going to use images you know. I'm going to use... So, uh, my, uh, like I, can, I could write an, probably an entire letter to Drew Moss with nothing but office references. He has seen every episode of The Office 4,300 times. It's a little bit of a sickness in him. And because I know he's got this image bank of very, very funny images, I could write him an entire letter of just quotes and allusions, and he would get all of it. Whereas someone who's never put in all the hard work necessary to be an office expert wouldn't get it. And that's how John writes to the churches in Asia Minor. Um, unlike most of the prophetic books, not booze, books, <laughs> you can tell I was running out of time, uh, apocalypses are literary works from the beginning. So for instance, Isaiah, it, he didn't write it. Actually, I don't know if Isaiah wrote a single word of Isaiah. They are his words someone else is recording, likely an assistant or a, a disciple of his that are being written down. Um, the apocalypses are literary works from the beginning. So if, uh, if, I mean, Revelation was intended to be heard because you're sending it to the churches and it'll be read over them, but it was crafted. It was crafted. Try to find like an order in the book of Isaiah. Good luck. It is an assistant uh, like accumulating prophecies over decades of ministry and there's, I would argue that they actually, they're clustered more in terms of theme instead of chronology. Because it's just, it's, it's a book of what Isaiah said. The, the revelation is intended to be read in order. Most frequently, the stuff of apocalyptic literature is presented in the forms of visions and dreams in the language is cryptic and symbolic. The images of apocalyptic literature are often forms of fantasy rather than reality. 
So specific steps for how to interpret and apply ap ap apocalyptic writings. Seek the authors and therewith the Holy Spirit's original intent. What was John trying to do? We view Revelation, say, if we're going to talk about that apocalyptic book, we think it's terrifying and we should just avoid it like the plague, which I'm pretty sure it mentions like seven plagues. We should avoid it like all seven of the plagues. That's, John wrote it to encourage believers, believe it or not. That is why he wrote it. They're like, man, this is miserable. Rome's going to kill us. Why did we sign up for this? And he wrote them the book of Revelation to say, don't worry, it's not that bad. <laughs> and we view it as something terrifying, and it was encouraging. The book of Revelation, in a nutshell, is the story that Caesar is doomed, Rome will fall, Jesus already won. That is the two-sentence version of Revelation. And John knew who he was writing to, and he wrote in such a way that they would get it and be encouraged. Be sensitive to the rich background of ideas that have gone into the composition of the work. Again, many of these Old Testament prophetic books went into the, the book of Revelation. When the author himself interprets his images, and this is important, there are points in the book of Revelation where John says, this is what I mean by that. <laughs> and when he does that, we do not get to put any other meaning on it. When he sets the meaning, we let it stay there. And sometimes I was like, John was like, this is what I meant by that. And then like 2,000 years later, we're like, I wonder what John meant by that. Maybe it was Apache helicopters. This is Jim's favorite thing. You can tell kid grew up mostly at the end of the Cold War. And, and he always thinks that, you know, the locusts are Apache helicopters. I don't know what, you know, kid that grew up with all the Afghanistan and Iraq war, what my images are going to be. But probably Facebook spied on me. That's probably what it's going to be. Um, number four, we must see the visions as holes and not allegorically press all the details. This is, so this is like... When you get to, say, Revelation 12, verses 1 through 7, any of you, when I'm telling that that's the Christmas story a few minutes ago, think, uh, there's some details in there that don't really line up with the Christmas story. There are. But John is giving us a picture, and he's saying, don't zoom in on the details. Get the picture. Don't look at how much of an average painting the Mona Lisa is. Get the picture. Don't look at the brush strokes, the picture. And that's what you do with apocalyptic literature. Um, in the book of Revelation, John expects his readers to hear his echoes of the Old Testament as the continuation and consummation of that story. So the revelation is not something new. It is the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament texts. And then Apocalypse is in general, and the revelation in particular, seldom intend to give a detailed chronological account of the future. In fact, I would say Revelation tells the same story at least three times. The story is effectively over by, like, chapter 8. And then it just starts over. And each time it tells a story, it's in a more intensified form. It's a literary technique called recapitulation. I'm going to tell you the same thing over and over and over. And I'm going to switch the images. That's why you go from seven trumpets to seven bowls to, uh, what's the other thing, seven plagues? I don't think that's right. Seven cups? Hmm? Seven woes. It, it, it just, it, he's telling the same story over and over. It's not like, well, then there's seven years of this, and then seven years of that, and seven years of that. By the way, the rider on the white horse, when we taught Revelation three or four years ago, um, so I'll leave you with this. This blew me away. I actually had to teach this lesson, so I, I had to work through all of it. And I, when I came to my initial conclusions, I thought, that cannot be right. And I went into Jim's office and I said, hold on. Are you telling me? He's like, I know, it's cool when you actually read it, huh? So when you look at Revelation 19, so verse 11, it says, Then I saw heaven open. This is the end of the book. When I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on the head are many diadems, and he has a name written on that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Who, of course, we're we talking about Jesus. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword and with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. By the way, that's proof that Jesus has a tattoo. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now we read this and we think, okay, um... When that happens, that's going to be spectacular. But we don't have time, and, and quite frankly, I don't remember how to get there because it's just 
there's a lot around it. But the point is, we look at this as some future event. When John meant, like he's describing what happened on the cross. The rider on the white horse has already come. Everything that is being defeated and destroyed, it's like, hold on. That's not in the future. That was when he died. And so all that to say, John doesn't go in order. And we have to let the images stand for themselves. Now he goes in, in, I think, it's not like he's just, he's not chaos, but there are some things in there that just a slow reading of, wow. John, again, we're going to go with the, the seven bowls pouring out, seven trumpets. So they're not intended to give a chronological account. Any interpretation, by the way, if you kind of like have the ability to, to look at the book of Revelation and say, okay, this is when the world's going to end. Jesus said, don't do that, and by the way, you're wrong. So um, my favorite story is a uh, professor in grad school. He, had, he, bought, he buys any single book where anybody ever predicts the end of the world, loves them. But he buys them to kind of make fun of them because Jesus said, don't do that. And, and, he, and he has a shelf full of them. And whenever like, the date that they give comes and goes and the world doesn't end, he puts a little red sticker on the spine. And in his office, he has a shelf full of books with red stickers on them. And it's just proof to all of his students, don't do that. Look at all these guys. Look at all these people that are published authors and fools. <laughs> um, so the key to this is any interpretation of apocaly apocalyptic literature must be intrinsic to the text itself. We really should spend less time paying attention to newspapers with Apocalypse, and more time paying attention to what John had to say. Or otherwise, uh, it has to be intrinsic to the text itself or otherwise available to the original recipients from their own historical context. Revelation, probably more than any other book, is, uh, is we can do it better by remembering it can't mean anything to us today that it didn't mean to the saints in Smyrna. And in ancient Ephesus, it had to mean something to them. And whatever it meant to them, that's what it means. And I think it's just the same message. Don't worry. Everything that is against Jesus will get kicked in the teeth eventually. And even though it looks dark for you now, like it's over. The rider on the white horse, this is why it's so encouraging, has already come. It's a beautiful message. And there are tricks to, I don't call them tricks, but just reading it well can help us a lot. Okay, I went longer than I expected, but uh, I will let you guys go. I appreciate your, your patience this, this semester, this, uh, this coming semester. He starts here in June. Mackenzie Johnson, some of you probably know him. He is moving to Poland in December to plant churches, but in the meantime, he'll get here in June. He's going to be interning with me, and he wants a lot of teaching opportunities, so I'm excited to use him, um, and he's a gifted teacher. So... We will have him with us this fall as we study who Jesus is. Go in peace, my friends. Turn this off.